Here I am a senior front-end software developer. I uh, work for enterprise companies to mid-level startups to now a super micro size startup. It's about 20 of us currently. I uh, work primarily on the Angular side, um, a little bit of backend and, and DevOps. And one of the things that I also do is I also lead a team of front-end developers as well, so junior devs um, in this case. So that's what I currently do. And on the side, I also have my own startup that I'm working on called Infurex. Uh, spelled pretty unique. It's I N F E W E N C, and influencers essentially a platform to allow you to leave reviews on different influencers, similar to how you can leave reviews on Glassdoor for different companies. So that's a quick little intro on me, and you can go ahead and flow. Awesome, cool. So my name is Flo Davis. I don't know um, how much you want me to give, so I'll just keep it really, really light. Um, I'm currently um, I'm an engineering manager at a I could say mid-sized uh, financial institution on the way growing uh, to a, a large, larger one. I do currently lead a team of software uh, developers um, on the digital end. Um, I, I can say for most of my career, I specialize in the front end, um, but you know, as we get further in, there's um, definitely uh, my developers are full stack developers. So that's the, that's the little tidbit I'll give you and I'll let you guys, I mean, depending on how you, uh, it, Ask questions, we can get deeper into the West of my background. So, cool. no, that was a good sample side right there. So, that works. <laughs> so, the way that the stand up works, uh, similar to how stand up works whenever you're at your own full time job or within a, a tech sector. So, the way that it works within the tech sector is you have stand ups in the, mor in the morning time, and what you can expect to see or expect to happen within that stand up is you have each individual within a team go over three things. And the three things that they're going over is what they worked on yesterday, what they were able to complete yesterday. The second thing is what they're currently going to be working on as of today, as their task, their to-do item. And then the third thing with the next stand-up is talking about things that are blockers, things that are kind of prohibiting you from getting your job done. So that's the whole entire idea of the stand-up within your nine-to-five, within any uh, you know, tech sector, or even outside of a tech sector, but it's a team space. And what we want to do is be able to bring that same talking points, the same outline of a stand-up over. Oh, we got a special guest. <laughs> yeah, she won't, but she just, she's, she's got to show out. But, oh, she's smart enough to, to stay in the background. I'm very happy now. <laughs> That's right. Here we go, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There you got the bell going on. Yeah. So, yeah, we want to be able to bring the same talking points that we have in the stand-up over to what you would uh, have on this live session. So within the live session, uh, between the both of us, but mainly on Flo's end, because she is the special guest, we will be talking about things that she worked on in her past before she was in the, the tech space. Then we also talk about things that she is actively doing as of today. And uh, lastly, blockers, things that she might have seen that were you know difficult for her to kind of get through within her career, but how she was able to push through. And this is a super exciting live super excited, exciting conversation because you have somebody who has nearly 15 years experience within the tech space so i only have like a, a good seven a good seven i'm pushing eight but you have twice as much so i know you've probably seen so much more changes within the tech space from the way that we had managed databases within in-house you know companies within themselves to you know, the cloud and past the cloud now we're talking ai so I'm super excited to kind of pick your brain about these topics and kind of see exactly what your thoughts are in, on all of those things. Cool. Awesome. So I can start off. I mean, for today, I have a little blocker <laughs> during this live <laughs> that won't let me be. So that's one of the blockers. But yeah, so um, in our team, we do, um, again, I, I, I manage a software development team. So we do our stand up four days a week. Same thing, like you're saying, in the morning. Um, for me, specifically, um, what I was working on uh, yesterday was a lot of meetings and strategies, same thing, kind of same situation kind of today. So there's oh, some- Oh, let me, uh, I don't oh, want to cut you off. Yeah, Cause I know no you're into details. So I would, I'm gonna ask the question this way. Okay. So it's gonna be more of a broader sense versus like okay. what you're actually doing in your nine to five. Okay. So it's gonna be more about like you, cause you're, you're the, the starter. So in this case, Okay. so we want to be able to, so the question for you is, before you were in tech, mm -hmm. what were you doing exactly? Wow. Okay. So before tech, uh, I, I guess I could 
man, I don't, it's, that was hard for me. So I guess before tech, I think elementary school and middle school, I was drawing. I like to draw a lot. So I was in art and graphic design and it was middle school. I believe it was my eighth grade year. It might've been, or it might've been the freshman year of high school is actually where I made it that transition. So I had my first web design class. Um, mm -hmm. and if anybody in Florida, um, at Hillsborough High School, uh, freshman year, and that's when I got into kind of building websites from there. So I can say tech started kind of early for me. Um, and then just in general, computers, I was always into computers. Um, to tell you the truth, I played video games from, <laughs> I mean, I had a, an Atari. So that was a weird question. I feel like if I just technically say I've been tech my whole life because I've been doing computer games and, and gaming and stuff since I was uh, six years old. I honestly, it's so funny, I don't play them as much now, but I have like all the game systems. So yeah, that question is funny because I feel it's like, I don't know, it's, it's been almost from inception, mm. uh, really me, you know, dabbling on the computer where it's a calculator or, or, or whatever. So. Wow. No, I, and that's a, a surprising because most people say that they're introduced to tech either from like a friend or family member who was into it. But in your case, it seems to be that you were kind of, you found your own interest in it. And yeah, you, yeah, just, interest in, you kind of built out. Yeah, just your career. naturally. I mean, again, it was still, it started off again before it was like actually like a computer was, it always start, it started off from an artistic um, lens, but it kind of lent to that, it lended me to uh, um, technology. So that's already, oh, you know, I, I am, let me, let me step back. There was a moment um in my life too and that, again that was middle school i was really into acting so i don't know how i made that shift <laughs> but somewhere that ninth grade i made that shift where i was like okay let me do more design art type of in motion and i felt web design was in motion but i didn't need i didn't do go the video route because at that time i mean who could for i could then have a supercomputer to like really build out and edit videos and also i didn't have the patience um either to do video so that's that's kind of how that me going into web design started right, cool. yeah. so i think you so i think you made a, a, a good point so earlier on in the conversation you mentioned how you, you started off more so on the front end side mm -hmm. and then you kind of also mentioned how you kind of focused on the web design side Mm -hmm. so you feel like there was like a correlation between the two. Like you started off in tech, you're always interested, you're in gaming, slowly kind of creeped into the, the web design piece. Then from there, that's kind of where you found your, your sweet spot. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely where I found Because um, again, before, if I want to be honest, before I got a job, it was almost like the kind of the hustling thing. So I built websites for people. So, you know, it was, it was a solid skill that I already had that, um, that kind of came that also had the income that I was looking for. Cause I always had like kind of a hustler mentality. So like, okay, oh, you need a website building back in the day, you had to do both. They weren't so separated. Now, now I probably couldn't design a website. I can code it out, but my design is like, eh, in, ter in terms of a uh, skill. So that's, I feel like that's what made the, um, that made me get better and better at the past just because I was, you know, actually making money from it mm -hmm. income. No, and I think that's a, that's a super good point you just mentioned. So you started off always interested in tech and you slowly got into the web design piece. Fast forward, you started building websites for folks. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of briefed past that out, but I would love to know a little bit more about that. So you, were you freelancing or did you have your own like consultation or agency that you're, you were managing yourself? Um, in the beginning, totally freelance. So I was just out there kind of learning. I, I put stuff out on Craigslist. I built stuff for friends. And then it was the entire, um, when I can say when I was really, really hustling and in college and then right after college, because that, that was the portion that was a little bit rough. That's where I end up. We'll, you know, we'll probably get deeper into that. But that was the reason really I went to California and really got all my experience because I couldn't find a job um in florida but um it was totally just freelance so i didn't even though it's always in there that's you know college is what what piqued my business mind because i did have that business degree so i didn't go in in terms of a, a traditional computer science background it was like management information system so 
it be technically based on my a degree, I should have came out like a business analyst or something mm -hmm. like that. But um, yeah, the web websites, um, I was just getting paid. So flyers, I think CD covers were really big that at that point because everybody was trying to rap. I think they still kind of do that now. <laughs> little, little animations, but like, again, also websites. So I would do design in Adobe Photoshop or even back in the day, they had something when they bought out Macromedia, they had some fireworks. So sometimes I would like sketch or whatever my design and fireworks and then development from there, from HTML, CSS. And back then it was like, again, I started on the front end. So I could say it was, it was HTML, CSS is where I started. Um, I can say I didn't get into like actually more program, programmatic technologies until, um, until LinkedIn, um, in, 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 ter in terms of working at like larger corporations, I was okay with it. Like I'll throw it in there just to do little uh, cute stuff or whatever, but it wasn't, I wasn't building out hardcore applications um, in the beginning of my career. Got it, got it. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, I know Man, I'm, I'm, I'm buzzing all over the place, I love it. <laughs> And for those that are just hopping in and what's up, uh, my, my boy Syed is in here, King Hill, but we got you in the building. Uh, so for those that are hopping in, you might hear a bell every now and then. It's because the bell is going to help me clip these these parts of the videos that I think got a lot of juicy information into it. Uh, so you, you mentioned a lot about the freelance experience, how you built out essentially static websites. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know how much did your freelancing experience that you kind of put yourself into help get your first job? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, because I remember um, there was a job. So my first job at California was original footwear company, but I think that helped me too. So I, you know, there I did a portfolio there and they, they, they see my portfolio. And then I went to the job, did the interview, boom, I got that smaller company. But after that, I picked up another freelance gig where um, I created a design for them, but I think it was just too offer just it was just too weird and creative um after that is that that same design um so let me back up a lot of a lot of my jobs too which i i feel like it's a blessing for me because in terms of when i was in school and just in general what type of long, learner i am i'm always i'm always really nervous with time tests if that makes sense simple so for me what helped me out a lot, even though it may not work for other people. A lot of times I got my foot in the door by contracting consulting, and then they see how good my work is, and then like, oh, we have to hire this person full time. So at LinkedIn, I was literally hired because of my portfolio. So like it was, I was hired actually as a Drupal developer. So I had no Drupal experience or anything, but I came in, the portfolio was like, okay, they're blown away by the portfolio. Like, okay, cool, that's good. You could learn Drupal and you could learn all these technologies on the job. So that's really, yeah, my freelance, yeah, that was pivotal for me because it was me actually going out there and say, I'm going to get the, I'm going to make the experience anyway, even though you guys are not giving me the opportunity. And then that blessed me with some of the most um, amazing careers in my life. Um, and again, then, then I really learn hardcore stuff on the job because LinkedIn was a, such a large uh, corporation. That's when I got introduced to everything. So I got introduced to like, you know, I, before, if I want to be frank, um, I did do some stuff with Notepad, and when I learned, you know, traditional web design, that's how you have to learn through the class, Notepad and all that, but I was using Dreamweave and all that, they set that on fire, so my first week, I'm on the terminal, I need to, I need to learn all these Linux commands, terminal commands, I had to learn a book, I had to learn Drupal, <laughs> I had to learn how to be in the server, so it really was a shot, I had to learn, you know, re repository, so it's, it's Speaking of my age, dating back, you know, now everybody uses Git. I've used Subversion, I've used TFS, I've used Subversion plus Git. So I've had like quite a lot of experience um, in repositories. But yeah, that was all on the job training, just studying, learning, Googling, Stack Overflowing, and just kind of going with the flow. And then at LinkedIn at the time, we had so many different technologies, at least in the marketing department, that's where they're kind of going rogue. Um, on the main stack, and again, this is probably 2011, their main stack on the back end, I can speak of this now because they're in a completely different stack. Right? <laughs> but their main stack in the background, they're like, like on the main LinkedIn site or whatever that you're using. Um, the front end was like JSP, Java, but in the back mm. end they had like Java. So they had JSP on the front end for that front end layer, and then in the back end Java 
and the marketing department where I was hired, we had so many different uh, technologies. We had ModX, we had Drupal, we had WordX, WordPress, we had uh, simple HTML, CSS, JavaScript sites, just so many different um, Python. We had, so we just had a hodgepodge because a lot of times with marketing, they have to move so fast. They might get a consultant to do something. And then they, they, after that's done, then they drop it off for our team to maintain whatever the consultant is doing. And then we had to go from there. But near the end of my career there, we did move to a, a more solid content management uh, platform, which is Adobe CQ. And again, that's still Java based, um, but it has, you know, it's a really pretty, it's a pretty robust um, CMS. So, yeah, no, so I, the experience from the freelance landed you that, that first full time yeah. job and and then, and, really and then it was up, pretty up trajectory from there. Yep. So it really just takes that one, that one opportunity to kind of scale your, your career. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, we're going to slowly get used to it, but no, I love that. I love the amount of detail you started with that because a lot of folks, they would reach out to me on Instagram. They're like, Hey, how do I get started in tech? And or how do I get my first software uh, software developer uh, position? And it's usually the same thing that I, that I tell them: get started. Yeah. You know, do what you can right now. And I think you definitely highlighted that because you got started yourself. You went to school for essentially a management degree, yeah. but you took that management degree and your interest in design and software development and merged it to. And by merging the two, you became a freelance developer. And then the freelance work that you're doing, that's your consulting work. And then the consulting work that you're doing, that's your first full-time job, which is crazy that it was with LinkedIn. So with all of that being said, what would be like the advice to, that you would give somebody who is looking to become a junior dev? Yeah, the junior dev, the same thing. I, what I like, if I could do it again, um, I actually do like Accelerator. So I, I remember when I was tired of the front end and then somehow that's, I mean, because I was actually, my path, once I was sick of the front end, I want to do the path of an architect. Um, but I, I feel, I still doing the same thing, but now it's kind of like plus managing people. So I still like it, but architect is more um, isolated. What I would say is try that accelerator. I know those, those can be somewhat costly, but they're cheaper than co college, um, in my opinion. I like General Assembly. There's a lot out there that you can try. But plus, like you're saying, the freelance do the work. I like the accelerator because they, you know, General Assembly, you might do, I've hired a developer from General, General Assembly. You might be, do 30, 40 projects. And the thing about General Assembly, I remember um, I had an offer part-time to work there, but I ended up uh, not um, taking it, is the thing that struck me from that in college, and then every my, everyone might have a different experience. My, I think it was my database teacher or my web programming teacher, one of those people really that I, when I was learning, he's the one who made me be like, okay, I'm not gonna do computer science. This is not for me. I'm gonna do management or something else. It's like, oh, you either have it or you don't type thing. And I didn't, re it wasn't until out there in my career that I realized you don't just have to do a book. You could do, you could look at different books. You could look at YouTube. There's different teaching styles, but I just didn't know um, at that time. So I would say build stuff. Don't be afraid of different type of learning styles. I think freelance, but also be careful. Um, my first couple ones, I did get burnt for type of learning. So make sure that, you know, before you have any work or something, it's, now we're so advanced, AI, Google, everything, get you a sample contract or something to make sure you're getting paid. So I would never do any type of work when now without a deposit. And then also know yourself too. So you might be the type of person that can't take full money up front, maybe do maybe 25%, 30%, so it can all be even out. And then I've learned near the end of my free, freelancing career to kind of do a phase approach, like per component, I'll get paid per component. And then we just kind of built, so no one, no one in that relationship is kind of left out in the cold. But I, yeah, I could say for me, definitely freelance. I've also got internships too, though. So the blessing of going to college, so um, there's a company, McNich McNichols, I was like a techno technology intern too. So that did open my eyes to other things too. So internships, freelancing, build, do the work, and don't be afraid to learn um, in, in, different, in different methods, right? It just, if one teacher doesn't work, doesn't mean it's not for you.
Um, so that would be my recommendation for like a geodesk. Yeah, I love that. Oh yeah, the networking too. Like I said, because you again, like I said, um, when I got back, when I took a career break and I got back into it, you know, I I went to the I went to the accelerator, but again, um, I was poached <laughs> by my former company, uh, Raymond James, through a consultant um, that was just at a networking event. So there's that too. Yeah, no, I love that. And the networking piece, I think it's uh, it's a super pivotal piece. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of recruiters, a lot of people, hiring managers, yeah. they get resumes all the time, every single day. You know, I just slowly got into my lead position and slowly started managing a team. But the amount of resumes that I get from people randomly in college just wanted to get started is, is crazy. Yeah. So I can't imagine for you how it might be as an engineering manager. But I think what you mentioned about networking is, is key. Yeah. The best way to kind of stand out and single yourself out from a group of resumes is to come as who you are. Yeah. So yeah. 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 So th those are the people that I kind of remember, or and then also have some impressive to show me, um, too. Um, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, go by your word. I, I made that mistake too. I hired somebody with a great resume, wasn't really hitting on the resume. So, you know, show me something that you've done um, that's kind of worthy of why I should hire you. No, I like that part as well. So, two things, two questions I, I want to ask you. And I'm, I'm saying it out loud so I don't forget. <laughs> uh, the, the first one is, and you don't got to answer them, hopefully. I just want you to answer mm -hmm. the second one. But the first question is, you mentioned about the teaching styles, mm -hmm. how sometimes your initial teacher, it might be in college, it might be in a boot camp, isn't the best suited teacher for you, but it's still your responsibility to look for different sources outside to kind of learn about technology or how to get into software development. So that's the one question that I, I'm gonna ask you. And then the second one that you can go ahead and answer after I ask you is, I'm sure you've interviewed hundreds of software developers at this, at this time know as you being a, an engineering manager so what are one of the, the key things that you look for as an engineering manager when you're looking to hire your next software dev um so for me i i, I can say i'm definitely not as hard, hardcore as other people because i think about myself when i was going through the experience so i'm not gonna lie i'm probably not gonna ask you like a bunch of algorithms or anything like that but i will give you a practical application to build so I need to know. So the the one one of the the best developers I hired, um, I gave him kind of like a weekend exercise, and like I see how he built it. Was the code clean? Was it designed? Does it make sense? Are you able to explain it? Um, I'll probably ask questions. But yeah, that for that's that's more of my style. I you know you know I know Google and we got all these different approaches, but I'm looking like okay, what are we really doing in practicality? Can you build that? Also, I'm looking at someone who's very agile like myself and can learn quickly. So even though like he was an all-star developer, I didn't know until talking to him, you know, me explaining, okay, hey, you know, cause he's somewhat my technology lead now. These are the different technology stacks that we're using and he pretty much learned them all. So that was really dope to me. <laughs> and I think he already had like a lot of this background. So being able to be flexible, being able to, even if it's new read through documentation, because that is, that was my career. Every There's not one job that I set foot in as a developer where I didn't have to learn a new technology or, um, or a completely new stack. So it's really, it's really about not being so stuck on, you know, maybe one programming language or anything, but it's about your, your ability to learn and agile and just your built, your base foundation of like the, the foundational patterns to build, to build good applications, web applications, that's what I look at, since that's been uh, primarily um, my my focus uh, for my career. I'm good. I got gems all over the place. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like a gold mine here. <laughs> no, I, I, as a, and I see some of your comment section, super hard time. You can see the comment section, right? 
Yeah, she, I look up to see what Flo thinks, Tommy. I feel like I feel like Tommy might have been one of my interns at LinkedIn. I can't remember Tommy. Did I? Did I? Did, did, were, were, were we at Europe together? I did. I did a lot of mentorship too. I love it. I'm not gonna oh, lie. I totally love it. Yeah. Okay, that's actually pretty, pretty dope. So you have one of your former interns in, in the comment section. <laughs> yeah, he he may be. I'm just I'm trying to remember. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get my mind right. <laughs> yeah. So, and one of the things that you mentioned, uh, and that I actually like a lot, is your as an engineering manager, one of your hiring styles that you mentioned was, you like to be able to give them projects. Yeah. Right. And the reason why I like that is because for me also, I've done a few interviews myself, probably not up to a hundred like like you have done but I've done a few interviews myself. One of the things I also prefer to do is to give out projects. Mm -hmm. And projects can be tedious, especially if you're somebody who is applying to 30 to 50 jobs within a week. But as the company, as an engineering manager, when you're able to diss out different projects, uh, essentially what you're, you're doing is you kind of help filtering out you know, the, the best engineer for your, in your case. Because you're being able to look at somebody who has not just the skill sets to get the, the project done, but secondly, and probably like the most important part, you're also talking to somebody who can comprehend a task and break it down into different pieces and get that task into an actual finished product. Yep. So that's one of the things that I, I prefer about the project approach with these interviews and just the hiring process versus the data structures and algorithms. Yeah. And like like I said, there's a lot of my peers. I just went to like a, a networking event probably like a few months ago. I, I mean, there was, I mean, and he was a bright guy. He was talking about, it, it was one I was interested in talking about AI and, and he still does that. I per se, I just don't do that data structure algorithm process. So, I mean, I get it. Um, and, and if I was, and if I was, uh, my role was we were working with large data sets that may, I feel like it may make sense. But for, for what we're doing at this time, um, I think that agility and learning is good. And then also another thing I want to touch on when you're talking about like looking through the different interviews, right? I can even say another example. I had someone, prime example, with a sharp portfolio and just clean, everything looked perfect. I mean, his GitHub looked like he worked for like, I, oh, I don't want to say Twitter now, that's a bad example. <laughs> but like his, his GitHub looked like he worked for Google or something or was an evangelist, but actually, when I compared his code, when he felt in the project to the one that I have now, the same thing. So you could really go and see, is this code clean and articulate? And they're like, okay, it's much the, the, the person I end up hiring, thank God that we did the test, right? If I, if I were just gonna go by looks, I would've went to one with this polished, beautiful portfolio and GitHub, not just portfolio, like GitHub looked really nice too, but you know, people do anything. People can probably pay people to build out projects you know that was i remember I, I remember that was weird when i experienced that too so um so i think that's a really important piece for me to really be able to look at your code before i hire you cool. and one of the things that you mentioned that um, was a really good point so you you stated how, how you know these projects are tend to lean towards your side with the hiring process but my question for you is, and it's gonna be a, a tricky question. So, <laughs> so as an engineering manager, mm -hmm. you prefer to give people projects and then complete the projects in uh, you know a timely fashion for yep. you to be able to understand if they're a good fit for the company or not. Yep. However, with the push of AI, with the push of JetGPT, and all of these AI systems that can essentially code for you, how do you kind of filter the engineers that you want to get on a team accordingly because essentially they can take the project and the tasks that you give them and go to chat gpt and they and you know that ai can do it themselves so that I, i'm not gonna lie uh victor that's a new one for me so we just now actually started using it when i when i hired um most of my developers my my first year when i first got um at my current company that wasn't exploded now so that is something that I actually need to think about because you could take, especially chat GPT. I've tried, I actually tried all of my, and I use chat GPT a lot myself, um, even down to like, you know, my developers will even use it even for their performance evaluation. It doesn't bother me. It still looks clean as long as I know they've uh, done the work. But I mean, that is actually something I need to take into account uh, because 
you can put your code in there and it can clean it up. So there may need to be some something additional. I do now I, I did do a combination of, of both. Like I said, I focus on projects, but I did ask them several questions in the interview process if they made it past, you know, the project phase. But that that I may need to with chat GBT now add an additional amount of complexity because it is pretty darn good actually in, in writing. It, it writes pretty darn good code. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, but you know, is it is that may proceed? Is that different from Stack Overflow jumping on there again? We all did that. I'm not gonna. I was in your shoes too. <laughs> I did that too. But that does make me think that um, right now, now I'm full, so that's why I haven't been thinking about it. But it does make me think like, okay, I may need to add another level of complexity to my hiring process. But that's yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's something I haven't thought about. All right, cool, cool. So, you know, I, I definitely agree as well. So, I mean, uh, working for a startup, the hiring phase, you know, it wasn't as consistent as it is for somebody who's been at, you know, Google and LinkedIn and, uh, and Salesforce. But when we do go through the hiring phase, one of the things I, I got to think of myself is, you know, moving forward, are they using AI to assist them with these projects? Mm -hmm. And what kind of questions can I ask to kind of understand if they were using AI? And it's cool for you using it, but do you comprehend what exactly it was putting out to you? So it's definitely a tough situation that engineering managers like yourself will be facing as well as uh, anybody who's going through the hiring process of a software developer. Yep. So one of the questions I want to ask you also, uh, since we're within the topic of AI, then I'm going to go back to the initial question that I want to ask you. Uh, so as a, uh, as an engineering manager, a lot of junior developers would reach out to me and be concerned about this whole AI movement. And the concern that they would have is, is AI going to replace my job? Is there, a, uh, is there even a need for me to go to a boot camp or to become a software developer if AI is essentially going to wipe out my job? So somebody who's been in the, you know, the industry for 15 years, who's worked for LinkedIn, Salesforce, you know, you name it, Google, what is your interpretation of AI with the case of like junior developers trying to get into the industry? Um, I mean, I feel like it's the same thing, um, like it is with everything. I, I think, you know, from Google to automation at say per se McDonald's or servers or, or any, anything that you may be doing, it's gonna just um, weed out the inefficiency. Actually, I'm a fan of it. Um, I've been using it you know, right now, chat GPT is popular, but in terms of writing and stuff, I've been using it for, say, if I had to write something like WordTune and other AI tools for actually a while now for different, like, you know, I could say, like, at work, we'll have clubs or extracurricular projects. So I've been doing, I've been using WordTunes and AI for a while now. The thing um, that doesn't worry me about it is, it's kind of the same thing, I feel like, the difference between Google and Stack Overflow, like we've all used, um, you need to know what to ask. So you still need to have a solid understanding of programming principles or what you're trying to do or what are you, what are you like, prime example, like I'm, I'm, I'm really training my team, we're going to get more involved with AWS, right? I don't know about Terraform yet. So I wouldn't even know what question to ask about Terraform. So I'm not worried about AI you know, replacing a Terraform developer or maybe an architect. So I look at it as anything else. It's like a tool to make you faster and more efficient, just like how we build automations and automated tests. So I I feel like if you're good at what you're doing, you know the right question to ask. Again, the same thing I'm looking for when I'm hiring somebody, being agile, the same, just like mathematics, the same fundamental principles have been around for centuries. So I feel like if you have a good understanding of what you're doing, it's nothing, it's nothing you have to worry about. And then there's also this thing about prompt and engineering. So it can kind of help you to elaborate and write better questions and things. So I personally don't have a fear of it because again, you have to really know what you're doing to even know what to ask. You can't be like, oh, build a website. And then you're going to get a basic, like what? You're going to get a basic website or build this application. You know, you have to have some type of, you have to know, you you have to know about it before it, it can take over something. So now a mundane, if it's something 
if your job is like a mundane task and you're doing mundane things, to me, why would I have hire a developer anyway? Then my developer should be able to build out automations for that. Um, but again, that's just how life is. You just kind of evolve or die. It's kind of like, you know, typewriters. Book people still write books, but you know, they're not gonna write a book on a typewriter nowadays. So that that's my I, I have a more comfortable position with it because actually I've been using it before it like exploded in popularity. Yeah, and I love that. Yeah. And the, the typewriter analogy really kind of broke it down also. Yeah. So so let's say this, you know, you come out of the office one day and you have a intern who, you know, switched from business analyst interest, but now they want to be a software developer. But they come to you like, hey, Flo, I know you've been in the industry for 15 years. You're a software developer, now you're an engineering manager. Do you think I can still move into the software development role or would it be a waste of time? What would you just tell them based off the understanding of where AI is and where it's going to be in the future? I would tell them to move in it because, uh, again, it's just the same thing. If they're agile and they can learn quickly, especially the intern, I'm not going to be as hard on an intern. I'm looking at in terms of me hiring interns, you don't have to have all the facts or the foundations, right? Because I'm expecting for you to have me help your intern. I would be looking at my my number one thing, are you agile? Do you know how to think? Can you learn things quickly? Um, because that's just the nature, honestly, that's just the nature of development anyway. It moves at a lightning speed. So I would say go for it. If it feels like in your heart, like you want to learn stuff, you like to problem solve, take a chance. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I understand uh, a lot of concern with junior devs trying to get into the industry, industry and find their footing as a software developer. They, they have a lot of concerns with AI. Mm -hmm. They don't want to, you know, waste their time learning new tech stacks just to be replaced by some sort of artificial intelligence intelligence uh, system. But just to kind of say the same sentiment as you, you, it shouldn't be something that draws you back from wanting to, to do so. If you have any yeah. things to do so, and if you are skilled beyond what you might have thought, you know you can probably build out your own system. Yeah, and then I and then honestly take it to the next level. Like I said, you can't beat them, join them. So like just like how old careers will go, there's new themes already. There's new theme. There's new careers in terms of props engineering. So actually, actually learn how to use the open AI so you can build your own systems. So you know you don't have to take it and be afraid of it. It's been here. Only thing that ChatGPT made it was just like what Google or anybody else did or Instagram. They made it publicly accessible. The, the technology has been here 30 plus years. It's been here longer than I've been in this technology career. So instead of, I just feel like just go on lean in and embrace it and be like, okay, how can I use this to be more effective and 10x or 10 up uh, my skills? That's that's that that's the right, in my opinion, the right mindset to have. It's not going to go anywhere, but just with that, then there'll be new jobs and new things that you might do. It might be we might probably be doing more sophisticated things, um, but it's still it's still the fundamentals um, is still there in terms of software development. No, yeah, I agree with that. And that the first question, I still remember it. So mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier how different learning styles are not suitable for, for all folks. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you go to a boot camp, the boot camp isn't the best experience that you might have received, and you kind of like drift away from the, the, the want or the need to learn how to become a software developer. You mentioned how if you still have the interest, there's other means of learning how to become a software developer. If it's books, if it's online courses, whatever the case is, you can still pursue that career in different, in different ways. So my question for you will be, what are some of the most helpful learning resources that you've came across uh, to for anybody who wants to get into the software developer industry? Cool. Um, when I think once I start really, whenever I get into something where I need to learn it for the first time, a deep understanding, probably since I'm a, a big picture thinker, um, it started off with videos for me. That's what I didn't realize. So a video and them actually not just them theory of what it is, but them actually practically building out an application, me seeing it from, so like, to long story short, tutorial videos. So like, um, who did I use a lot? I used, um, I enjoy Brad Traversy a lot. Um, I listen to Syntax FM in terms of podcasts. Um, I like Gary Simon. 
there used to be a guy, again, I've been primarily on the front end, so some of these will like be kind of front end, but we have notes, so you could do this full stack now. Um, so, but a lot of these are JavaScript people. But um, I also like, um, there's this guy um, who made me really like functional programming. So he's not, he's not as popular anymore. Not as popular, but I think he kind of stopped doing YouTube videos, but his old stuff is really good. So it's called Fun Fun Function. So that one is really, really good. Um, in the beginning, W3Schools used to be bad, but going to W3Schools.com is pretty darn good. Actually, the code is much cleaner. It was kind of, it was, it's pretty bad in the beginning, but it's much cleaner. So it actually has like, it shows you what this thing is here. And then you actually see the output on the right without you having to like set up anything for power. It could just, it's just like a, a, a learning environment. So you could just jump into it. Uh, right there. Um, like I said, if you do want to do the accelerator route, general, general assembly is really good. And then there's books too. Um, um, one actually, I'm sending my books, some of my books to one of my developers now because I'm like, yo, the, the more I get into management, yeah, unfortunately, just the more you get kind of dusty. So I'm like, it's just <laughs> that's been dusty on my wall. So there's a dude just in terms of foundational just software development that I like a lot of uh, um, his name's Uncle Bob so Robert Martin so there's clean code the clean coder um, and others also clean architecture so those are really and what I like about those books they're really they're really easy to read so nice really easy to read like uh, to me like I said they kind of read like a novel so I like those and even though they're talking about architectural and just good patterns in general um, they're just really easy read so those are some of the, I don't know, I don't know if I gave too many, but that gave kind of a little, because again, I do it all, <laughs> depending on when I'm learning something, I'll start in a video, there might be something where I need to be really specific, like I might pick up a book, I might go to medium.com and do an article, and now, like I said, for example, now I go to chat GPT, because Google has so much sponsored stuff now, it's like, it's almost like Google's going down and it's sad, but it is what it is, I can get whatever answer I'm looking for in chat GPT, so like people think so much about that, you know, the fear of it, but chat GPT is really good for learning. So you want to learn, hey, what does interfaces mean? Give me an example. Like chat GPT is dope. Or like, and you'd be like, okay, expound upon this. So, so chat GPT as well. Okay. Yeah, no, I like those, those uh, suggestions. So you mentioned videos, if not videos, you can always gravitate towards books mm -hmm. for different pieces in the book to kind of, you know, pick out what to focus on within it primarily. Uh, you also mentioned how just using AI or ChatGPT in this case is just as helpful as using any type of YouTube video or tutorial to kind of learn things. And then you also talked about uh, W3Schools, which I also share that same sentiment, how initially W3Schools, like back in the day, like six, five years ago, the website was kind of janky. Yeah. Now you can, you know, you can do test code within it. Uh, it seems to be that the browser server works pretty efficient. So I'm definitely a fan of like, once you learn, you know, how to, get this fundamental piece within the coding, take what you learn and play around within this playground. And the playground that you mentioned is W3Schools. That's a cool little, little tip for folks. <laughs> so uh, I think we spoke pretty decently about the things that you might have worked on prior to uh, software development. So we can kind of get into uh, a little bit more like in the front end space and then okay. gravitation was the engineering manager space. So you, uh, just to reiterate, you, you did some freelance work, freelance types of consultations, but I'd love to learn more about like what you did at LinkedIn and were you at LinkedIn before they got acquired? Um, yeah, I was before they got acquired. Okay. Yep. So you were at LinkedIn before Microsoft acquired them. So how was the, the culture at, at LinkedIn before it was acquired by, by Microsoft as a, a front end developer? Yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty good. I mean, LinkedIn is where I learned, you know, I can't, I can't just say LinkedIn, I can say Silicon Valley in general. Um, it really was that type of developer environment that you've seen on TV. Maybe not as exaggerated <laughs> as some of these, uh, maybe not as exaggerated as Silicon Valley, but even though there, I'll be honest, there were like, if you ever seen that show, there were some Silicon Valley type incidents um, that happened, but it was it's what they had. That was my introduction to hackathons at like 20 percent time and linkedin i can say one thing about that just in general uh linkedin had a really really good culture their ceo was really he he, he was awesome so i mean he he would sit down he had a, we had the open door 
policy of, for like all the manager stuff. His door will be open. Wow. You could talk to him at lunch. So I, I think it was a really, really good technology centric um, developer environment. So it, I could say it was a pretty good environment for developers. So I don't know, I don't know what's the um, culture since Microsoft, but I can definitely say it was a developer friendly environment. Now, one thing I will say, so I'm not just going to say all good stuff on my team, just because of the volume of work and our space and just the speed of how marketing is, we, we, I worked a lot um, on that team. So we did work a lot in, in terms of maybe different from product, um, product that the kind of opportunity to have a lot longer life cycles um, than I did on marketing. So, you know, it, it, it was normal to be multi working on multiple uh, projects at a time, but I could say in terms of the company as a whole is really good company culture. You know, that's exactly what I would expect from LinkedIn. I'm a, I'm a fan of the product, but of course, the Microsoft acquisition really stood out for me and it made sense. I think they were the two pair pretty good. So it's actually pretty cool to know that you worked for them prior to the acquisition and that, that open door policy with the CEO was, I'm sure that's pretty interesting. You know, a lot of uh, gems might've been dropped on both ends. So. Oh yeah, no, he was great. He, he, he was super dynamic. I can say that was probably the best CEO that I've worked for. Um, actually, because, you know, even down to any issues I was having a personal issue, the fact that he even reached out to me was really amazing. Like, you know, any of the other companies, I've never seen the CEO, any of the Silicon Valley companies. I've seen Jeff Weiner. Uh, he, like I said, he'll go to lunch with us because we had, now you'll gain a lot of weight there. We had, you know, they provide lunch, but he'll be right at the table eating lunch. So I, I like that um, at his level, he was just, like for the people. He was definitely a for the people leader. So definitely, probably, yeah, still by far one of the best CEOs that I've worked for. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, no, that's, that's pretty interesting. I always wanted to, because like I said, I work for a startup now. So mm -hmm. we are pre exits. Um, so pre acquisition or going to public offering. So oh, nice. being able to, uh, you know, work within a speedy environment but still be able to talk directly to the CEO is, is always a pretty cool thing. So you, you, you spoke to and had a conversation in relationship with one of the, the biggest ones out there. So <laughs> more props to you. So you mentioned, you mentioned how you, you worked within Silicon Valley. And I'm curious to know how was just uh, the scene of Silicon Valley as a software developer, especially, you know, a, a black software developer, was it as comfortable kind of moving into that space as it might be today? Hmm. Okay. That, yeah. That, so that one I had to think about. Um, it just depends really. I think unfortunately, um, in this space, we kind of, uh, we always kind of stand out just being, um, black in general. Like you have to really, you really have to have a high level of performance. I've seen a flexibility sometimes with my counterparts, um, that are different colors that I honestly just never had. Um, and, Honestly, and, it, and it's unfortunate. So that's probably why I really got into mentoring, especially, you know, year up. I, I, he's, he, he's, I don't think he's on the call anymore, but working with black, brown, Spanish, underprivileged people. Um, and year up, I'm shouting them out because that's a really big one where I got into mentoring and that's where I got a, had a lot of interns and stuff. But I thought it was really important to mentor them because still to this day, it's still, it's still not that many in that space where I am now. I'm the only Per, actually in my organization, when, uh, and, and I don't mean the whole organization, but in my organization structure, that's kind of insane. Um, so I, you know, I could say it's okay, but it, it is, it is kind of sad if I look, okay, 10, 15 years span, it's still the same like percentages. So it might be, you know, when I was at LinkedIn, there was one black software engineer on the back end and one senior um, software engineer on the front end, he was African and she was Jamaican. And then they at me, um, you know, at LinkedIn and then a lot of places, um, still the same thing. I was the only one. Um, so, you know, I could say in the middle, it could definitely be better. So that's why I'm always trying to push it, um, push that space. And I always was interested in like how the space within Silicon Valley worked. Of course, I had some internships back in Chicago I had um, you know, internships back when I was in college, of course, full time here in Tampa, but where all of the, the tech conversations start 
in many cases is in Silicon Valley. So I was always curious to know how that, you know, that kind of laid out. But I think what you're doing with being able to understand the, the differences within culture in Silicon Valley and come in with the idea, like, I understand that there's a gap and I want to be able to fill in that gap through mentoring. I think that's super cool. And yeah. A lot of people. Now, now, one thing I will speak on, because I remember when I came here, when I got back into the game, because I did take about a three year break and just did entrepreneurship and music and stuff, all of that. Um, I feel like Florida is probably more welcoming to that diversity um, and culture, uh, which is really cool. But Silicon Valley, as usual, <laughs> when I come here, you know, it's, 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 it's like, it's almost like I didn't take a break because we're so behind, you know, I came here and that's why I was like, oh, I guess I got to learn .NET because mm -hmm. everybody's on these windows. So they're actually like, they're still, they're still far behind what allowed me to still be up to date, even with taking like a three, four year break. Um, so that's kind of the difference. So definitely more open, I could say in Florida um, to, I guess that diversity of the space, even though again, still I, even though still I'm limited, but at least they're talking about it, right? At least when I was at Silicon Valley, they weren't talking about it. They didn't have this big uh, DEI push, but technology is ahead of where we are um, in this southern place. Yeah, yeah uh, that's, that's a, a good point. Depending on what region you are, the technical stack or the standard for the technical stack is different. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about regions within the states, within the U.S., from Florida to California, or we can go beyond that and we can talk about the different countries, you know, from Nigeria to the U.S. or from the U.S. to China or the U.S. to Russia. Depending on where you're at, the standard for technology is completely different. Like, we might be familiar with Angular and React, but in another country, they don't even know what that is. All they do is PHP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> So I also wanted to pick your brain about your, like, how was the software development experience at Google, right? Because Google is a fan company, one of the companies that a lot of software developers would probably dream about working at, and you were able to accomplish that. So how was your software development, development experience at Google? And did you primarily just do front end and back end or? Yeah, so that one I was blessed. So like, I'm going to be kind of completely honest. So I was a consultant there. I don't think I would have passed the interview process for Google. So I went through like, you know, um, I went through the steps because there's actually classes that they tell you to take before you because the, the interview process is so complex. But I had the, 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 the blessing to work on a prototype for the financing team. So they had a larger um, engineering um, thing there with building but you know they still needed something to run in the interim so i was able to consult for like maybe six months a year i can't recall how long it was to build an interim project um that one again i've I, I advanced so much i can say i, I was kind of weak <laughs> in my stack it was front end and back end but my back end i used for the back end i had you know google sheets um i'd use angular and then at the time before components were really popular there was this something that was called Polymer. Um, I also designed it as well using Google just came out with material design. So it did what it needed to do, but I can't say like I'm super proud of the project. It did work. And like I said, the fact that Google Sheets was kind of my back end. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of where that. Um, but again, I got to use material design. I used Angular, um, not a, not exciting, not the cleanest, but Angular, I, I did the, um, I stopped using in Angular once they got into like Angular 2, but at that point I used uh, Angular 1 um, at that time, one point whatever. Um, I played with it. There, there was like, I did have to do a little bit of promises. Um, I remember um, with that technology, but yeah, that, that one, that was pretty much the technology set. So it was really, it was really like an interim prototype that I got the opportunity to build. But again, it was dope because it was kind of out of free and they just needed to, they needed this into their larger project prosper was called, was done on their two years. And then um, with Google, at least where I was to deploy an application, you had to wrap it in like a Google app engine thing. So like you had to throw a Python wrapper on top of that. So that was the only additional thing, but I can say really, really light application 
application into comparison to the type of stuff that I build now or that my team builds. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's pretty interesting. And I like the, the transparency with the consultation, but not the consultation, working for a consulting company, being able to kind of help move you into these different uh, organizations that might be tough for a lot of individuals to yeah. really get into. So one of the questions I have for you is, what are like the benefits of being a consultant? I know you're an engineering manager now, but as a consultant, somebody who's, you know, more so a software developer front end or back end they can join a consulting company versus joining the actual organization themselves so what's one of the benefits that you came across uh, you come in high i can tell you that mm -hmm. you come in because um you don't have to they're not paying your insurance they don't have to give you you know they don't have to give you anything because you're a consultant so there they are negative so i i can only speak of, i'll speak about both sides the negative they can fire you when they want to because you just there's no obligation to you being a contractor, the, the positives is you come at high. The other positives is if you really work really well, I feel like it's a win-win in general because it's kind of like a try before you buy situation. Because again, there are different types of people. Some people are really good at taking tests. Some people look really good on paper, but it's seeing what you, how you actually function in the job really can show you, you know, oh, this is person is a dope to hire because again I, i've seen that too i know some people that are really really good at tests but when it comes to like something they're not ready for they, they they don't have they freeze up they don't know how to be agile and and just software develop you got to be agile <laughs> you're gonna every day you got to work on something new so you got to be willing to like learn new things all the time so um yeah so the, yeah consulting the money um also you have the opportunity you know, as, as to try a bunch of different things, right? So if you're really, really good at consulting and you like have this list of different people you're gonna work for, you're like, hey, I'll work the government job here. I'll dabble in Angular here. I'll dabble in React here. So maybe I do some PHP here, Python. You have all of that. You don't really get, um, cause sometimes when you're a job too long and you're good at, you can get stuck in kind of a thing. So I, that's why I am thankful for my path. I know at the beginning, I don't, I don't know if I was always excited about it, but it allowed me to try so many different things. Um, so that's another good thing about consulting. You yeah, know, I love that. So you mentioned benefits of being a consultant is the pay is higher yep. because you don't really get the bonuses. You don't really get to negotiate as much as um, you know, somebody else would do that's full time. But a con to that is you also don't get like the health benefits. You don't get the 401k uh, with the 401k match. You really just pay the salary and, and as long as you perform, you stay within that company. Yep. So no, that, I definitely understand that. And I, I know a lot of people will consultants for the, the pros <laughs> for, that, for that very case. So no, it completely makes sense. And I also thought about doing that myself, but you know, it's one of those things that I've seen how consultants I kind of like moved around from project to project to project. And it's one of those cases where what if I actually enjoy this project and I want to continue on building this project so I can see where you know, it leads to. And I wouldn't want to you know, just keep popping around. Yeah, and like I said, and, you know, you can be guaranteed, but sometimes you can even be good. And there is only a certain fact because again, in terms of now that I've, I'm into management stuff, you know, a consultant is an expense. So you could even, you could get rid of a situation like where you're a really good developer, but we're only expense so much for this project and you pass the um, expense. So it's not even about you going in there as a consultant sometimes and being, that's what I'm saying, the you being hired is not always a natural next step. So that's scary too. So you have to kind of be ahead, like have roles in the hopper for like, okay, this is a six month contract or this is strictly three months because they're only, they only budgeted for this much during this time. So that's, that's what you have to worry about too, that you don't really have to worry about um, in a full time role. Yeah, yeah. No, the first team, because I used to be a, a lead dev that managed a few developers, a uh, few on -sore, a few off mm -hmm. And I was managing a total of five at, at the most, at the highest time. And as I was managing these developers, one thing that was consistent with all of them was that they were all consultants. So they worked for emphasis. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I heard of them. Yeah. 
as I said, they work for Infosys, there's Deloitte, there's all types of uh, firms out there. Um, but one of the things that they always shared was just the, the fact that they would prefer to be full-time Sundays because yes, you are their direct manager. Um, in my case, I was a direct manager. However, they have another manager that's on the consulting side. And it's kind of like you pull in two strings with individuals. So it's always pretty interesting. But I would love to know, and this is a selfish question from my end, <laughs> but how was the transition from being a developer to an engineering manager? Like what steps did you do? What did you take in order to accomplish that, that new career goal? Oh, I was totally strategic. I can say, I could thank the person who hired me um, at Raymond James for that. Um, I think when I got back into development, I came from a place of being an entrepreneur. So like I, I thought, I thought that was really the only place that you could kind of be yourself, right? So um, when I when I got hired at Raymond James, that she was a really, really dynamic manager. And what she like, you know, advice she gave me is like, you can create your own path. They created, they, they've, and the career they created um, roles, you know, for her based on how she moved. So I really took, I really took that experience to the heart. So I came and they're kind of like a senior developer. They had some kind of, they had a weird talk, title, interactive developer, but like based on what, the, what, based on where they were, like I said, in technology and what I could be, I was moving so fast with that that I just added different things on. So I was really strategic. So I added process improvement. I added like, okay, us having a ticketing system of projects. Then I added, okay, let me do emails and email automations and data. So I start picking up so much other stuff. Then I added, you know, man, man, managing, you know, project charters and guidelines and somewhat of an agile process. So I start doing so many things that placed me more in a strategic management role. And that's when I kind of went to HR and I went to other people. It's like, hey, I've been doing these, these things, things that are so much beyond a developer. I should be in the management role. So that's kind of, that was the slow transition to be like, okay, so I probably was there two or so years as, you know, just a, a seer dad, but doing all these snippets that I, I looked and seen for what that a manager doing. And then I, I positioned myself based on my performance reviews and stuff like that to a manager based on like, cause I had kind of that feedback and that's kind of how I went from there. And then once I felt like that was, I reached my ceiling there um, based on so much stuff happened. The, my original leaders left um, and the, the trajectory, at least um, that portion was gone. That's when I took that experience and kind of apply it to somewhere else. It just kind of popped up. I'm like, oh, let me try it. You know, I had a, another friend that used to work there and yeah, that, that's kind of happened. So actually it was actually, it was actually strategic. It wasn't, it wasn't something that I thought I wanted ori originally. Um, but I, I think it, it was, I think it was needed because I had to experience some of my, you know, I had experienced people doing it not well to realize I was good at it. And also, um, again, it put me, because remember, um, when I got hired um, at Raymond James, my, my last company, I, that's before Raymond James, that's when I took my career break, break and I went to back to Accelerator to be focused on the back end. So my mind was already set for architectural, but I was like, okay, this is a job. <laughs> oh, here I go again at the front end. That's what I'm <laughs> serious. So I've, I was already set on being a back end where they're not bothering me about this button color or whatever. That's just so annoying to me. So I was already really full set on the, and it, but it just didn't work. But then I had, I had that mind to where like I was already making these architectural recommendations and all that stuff just kind of leading, leading into it. Once I got like all my front end work done, I was like, okay, well maybe we should move with this and we should go with this platform. So I just always already setting myself um, up for kind of being a manager lead. So. so strategic, it was a, it was a planned approach and I, I realized like, oh, I, I'm actually really darn good at this. That's why I got annoyed that people that didn't, didn't do it right. So no, uh, that approach, it was like definitely strategic and if not genius. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in order to, to become an engineering manager, the steps you took was get a position that was a senior dev role but look into the different specs of an engineering manager within the company. 
and start to take on tasks that's not related to your yep. current role as a developer. And as you're getting these tasks and you're setting yourself, you know, with these to-do items to complete things, by the time you had the performance review or your year-end review, you're saying, hey, this is my role. I'm a senior developer, but I'm also doing X, I'm doing Y, I'm doing Z, which is technically roles and the responsibilities of an engineering manager. And because I'm doing X, Y, and Z, and it seems to be working just fine, you might as well, hey, HR, bump me up to engineering, engineering manager. And that transition has to be a smooth one because you're already doing yep. exactly what they expect. That's correct. Yeah. So basically, you're doing it before you kind of, it's that sacrifice. You're kind of doing it before you're getting paid. You're doing it before, you know, you're getting the recognition. But I, that was the only way that I knew how to approach it, you know. But I mean, that's how I approach everything, you know, before you give me a chance. Okay, I'm going to show you yeah. <laughs> that I can do this, you know. So, so with that being said, you're an engineering, engineering manager, and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure you heard of this term a lot. If not heard of it, you've probably seen it. <laughs> And the term I'm referring to is quiet critting. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that at all? Yeah. Okay. So with the term quiet critting, for those that might not be familiar, it's essentially those who have a role as a front end developer. And when they go to work Monday through Friday, eight to five, all they do is exactly what their job description says. My job description says I do HTML, CSS, JavaScript, that's exactly what I'm going to be doing from Monday through Friday. I'm not going to be doing additional work that's not within my responsibilities within the actual job application I applied for. So the reason why I'm bringing up quiet credit is, as an engineering manager, what are some of the, the pros and the cons or the, the understandings that you might see from people who are quiet credit? Hmm. Oh, that's a good one. So I, I, I could say, my main goal um, in management is for me to uh, make an environment for my team where that's just not possible. Um, honestly, um, I, I, I don't, I don't want them to quite quit <laughs> to tell you the truth. So I'm, I'm looking at, are they, are they enjoying the work that they're doing? Do they love coming up? You know, you know, am I, am I listening to them and taking advantage of their skills? Skill set, or are they in the position that they need to be to uh, to succeed? Now, my career before, and I'm not going to tell who it is because I'll keep this open because I still got friends there, and I'm not, you know, <laughs> not into that. <laughs> but you know, the quiet quitting was like for them is when they lose vigor, and for me, because I did it too, but I I, I did it when I knew I had another job. It's like when I've presented everything that I need to do for you. Like, I, cause I, I feel like I look at a job almost like relationships, right? I have told you what I needed. I've showed you the experiences at this point. If you still don't care <laughs> and I'm presenting to you and I'm showing you these facts, then I'm like, oh, you're telling me that you don't give a shit. You don't care about me. So that's kind of when I quite quit. So for me, I try to create an environment to where they know that I care. And also the environment, well, if it's time for them to leave and there's not a match there, I want them to tell me that too. So right now I'm, I'm pretty blessed. I have, I have a all around high performing team, but I also have them in spaces that that's important to them, right? Cause I have, I have two ones that are really strong in software development. I keep them there. I don't have them designing, doing CSS, doing all that stuff like to the point where like, that I kind of hate it. I keep them in the software mayor development role. I have one that's a mix of a designer and developer. So I have him strong doing CSS, but then also have him doing mock-ups and things of applications. So he's doing a balance of that, that. And I have another one who's actually on a managerial lead path. So I have him doing that, helping me with projects, requirements gathering. He's the full cert, he's the full scrum master. So I'm so in tune with my team. To me, it's hard. I haven't experienced that yet. It's hard for me to allow that to happen, but I know what it happened to me, and I can say what happens to my my peers and my friends is they they just like a relationship. They put it out there. It wasn't respected. That's when it's like boom. So, in my opinion, if you're gonna do it, make sure you at least let your company know what you need and tell them the truth or what's required. If they don't respect it, um, then you can do whatever you feel. But I feel like if you don't at least tell them what the problem is, sometimes you don't know as a manager, but, but if you tell them the truth and everything, I don't see a problem with it because at the end of the day, 
you know, we we have these jobs, but it's not it's not our life because at the end of the day, there's some jobs that I've had. You know, you could die, and you know they'll send flowers, whatever, but they're you, they're gonna get the next person. So that's what I feel. But I feel like put it out there. If you feel like they're not meeting your needs, do what you need to do, but at least put it out there um, and let them know, hey, this is this is what I need. This is what I'm looking looking to do because they won't be able to know if you don't tell them. Yeah, that was. Ooh, ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. No, that was that was perfectly explained. I know during the pandemic, a lot of folks were kind of like hunkered down and just not really happy with their current situation, and a lot has to do because they wasn't going outside. But the the term "quiet quitting" really stemmed from that, where a lot of folks were like, "Hey, I'm doing X, Y, Z, and that's all I'm doing," and it and I understood where they're coming from is because they're putting all they got into, at that point, during the pandemic, their mental health, making sure that they can also prioritize themselves while still getting the work done. Yeah. But I, I like, as an engineer manager, I like what you what you said, where it's, hey, tell us what you're missing, what we can do to help you excel within your current position. And we, as an engineering manager and the team, will try our best to be able to help put you in the right position so you can also have enjoyment and what you're doing. So I think that's awesome. I, I can't imagine how you are as an engineer manager. I know the people just love you there. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm happy. But like I said, it's all from experience. I think my my former boss asked me about that too. And it's hilarious. I said it, it took actually bad experience to be like, okay, I don't want to create that experience for my team. So like, you know, I, I feel like the good, the bad, the everything is learning. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm curious also, and this could be the last question because I know we've been here for an hour. And I don't it's all good. Long. It's all good. <laughs> so I'm curious to know, with regards to how you got your position as an engineering manager, you detailed that pretty, mm -hmm. pretty well. Mm -hmm. But for those who say, unless I get a raise, I'm not going to perform into this position. Well, let me, let me question it like this. Because you know, a lot of times people will be like, hey, I want to be able to, you know, get a raise, but I'm not going to get a raise until you pay me first. I'm sorry, I want to be able to get this position, but I'm not going to fulfill that position until I get a raise first. You kind of did it backwards where you said, I'm going to perform at a high rate that's not related to my position. And based off my performance, I should be rewarded with a new um, expedited role of an engineering manager. So with that being said, the question is, for individuals who say that they should get paid first and then they perform later, what would you say to that? What I would say to that is life doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I had someone, even when I was at my prior company where I did make that transition, I had someone I remember, um, and I'm not going to put her out there that I, I told that too, like, it doesn't work like that. It's like, you know, even down in nature, you know, you say you want apples, you want to eat this, you have to plant, you have to plant the tree before it grows. It just doesn't work like that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how, I mean, it may work that way um, in a friendship or you have like a side corner to get some of that, but the thought, um, you have to put something out there to get some type of output. Like even as an entrepreneur, like just, I just feel like my life experience I'm naturally wired to like, okay, this is where I need to be. This is what I need to do to get there. Like even like right now, I'm taking really my health and working out seriously, right? This is this is the portion where I need to do, I need to evolve to get there. So that's like, like that's a lot of people's problem. Like, oh, I want the abs, I want all this, but I need it right now. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go to the gym or I need to go find it. That's to me, the, the logic is just crazy to me. So I wouldn't even know how to answer that question, but I've had, I've had it. And that's the only way I know how to do things through life. You have to plan it first. You have to you have to do the work first before it grows. So that's why it was just a natural transition to me. I'm like, okay, this is where I am. This is what I want. What is required to get to where I want to be? Because that's their problem. That's how life works. You need to do what's required before you get to where you need to go. I mean, unless you have some side way corner about doing that, that hasn't been my life. Um, so I had to work to get to wherever I am. Even down to, again, like I said, even down to like, 
LinkedIn, I built, I didn't, no one just came, hey, Flo, here's a job. You know, I, I had to actually create my own reality to get those different uh, positions. So. No, excellent point. And I like the, the honesty where you, where you said life doesn't work like that. And I yeah. totally agree. A lot of people expect to receive a trophy for a competition that they never played in or competed in. And that's what's uh, a, a lot of the problem. That goes for work. It goes for, you know, all type of. No, and I mean for everything. And I don't know who said this. I, I this just brought up the quote because I know you're a LeBron James fan, right? Before, before you know, before the championship, he been working. No one asked him to do all this through his childhood. No one asked him that. All the work began before the championship. So I can't. I can't name anyone in my life that I'm inspired by that haven't done the work first before they got the reward. That's what I'm saying. That's why the that's why that question for me and like it's funny. I've gotten it before. That doesn't compute because I'm like, where are you? You're not you. You're not seeing the full picture of things. No one no one did that <laughs> unless again you, it's your family or a buddy and just someone just gave you something that that doesn't happen in real life. So that's why that's why it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Yeah. Now, see, we had them before. Oh, yeah. So we got a topic of conversation. So I'm just talking about um, since everything art. So um, we're talking about engineering manager, but we actually got to just the topic of life, right? So I made a transition into management. And what Victor was saying before I made the transition, I actually did the work of a manager before I got into that transition. So um, that's kind of what we're kind of teeing up. So like, say, if you want something, right, you actually have to put in the work first before you get it. So um, he was saying that he had people ask him and people have asked me this as well. Too. He's like, hey, I want this role. I want to do this, but I need to get paid first. So like, why am I paying you? I haven't seen you do it. <laughs> that makes no sense to me. So that's kind of um, everything um, art that that's that's the conversation that we're kind of going on. Yeah. And is it and just to answer that's like why am I paying you first if you haven't proved anything? Yeah, do you, I do pay? You, what, you could be terrible at it. Yeah, do I get a refund? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't get it. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Well, I was engineer manager for a few years before I pivoted into tech. I currently work at Meta, but my journey was rough. Well, you are going to definitely be the next person we interview because I love to to pick your brain. Uh, the journey was rough at Meta. That sounds like a solid sentence right there. <laughs> So many things changing. And before we, we end the call, um, what's your, your thoughts about Thread? Right. So Meta came up with a competitor and another social media app. They're supposed to focus on the metaverse, but instead of the metaverse, they ran ahead and created another social media platform. So what's your thoughts about Thread? I don't know. I can't, I'm kind of like Gary Vee on it. I kind of jumped on it. I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I when Twitter first got out, it was um real popular you know i mean we are we already know how mark zuckerberg moves right <laughs> so you know mark zuckerberg will take some you know and and um jump on create an app but i'm not gonna lie i just since i've been i have this engineering mind but i also have this marketing mind because i've been in marketing teams my mostly my entire career too except for like google and a couple of places but like the marketing to me was genius so i i'm so i'm so like actually in awe of the marketing and the perfect timing. Like, it, you know, Ellen was going through that stuff and then he was doing the Twitter limits. And then here's, here comes Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Hey guys, we got this new thing, Threads. And all you gotta do is click and the user experience of it. So like, I, I'm not gonna lie, I'm amazed at the marketing. Like I said, I don't know where it's gonna go, but the marketing, the ease of use of it is really doing the same thing. So far that I've been on it, it seemed like a pretty positive app for some reason like twitter was just getting super toxic to me um so so far i think the only thing in my opinion how facebook kills everything if or meta or whatever they call themselves <laughs> at this, that's this point in time is if they don't go too heavy with the censorship but i understand there is should be a balance like i don't want to see anybody killing dogs or babies on there but it's like that's how to me facebook kills the app when they go in too deep with the censorship so i'm like what am i on here for you know if i can't say my opinion but it, it should be i get it, it should be within reason as yeah. well yeah no that's a, a very good point and you know you've been in the industry 15 years you already know how important integration integration is yeah so the integration that thread 
introduce where yeah. quick. Yeah. one click and you're in yeah because there was like there was this other one too i don't know what it was called. now i totally forgot because after the twitter said there was a few that popped up like there was this black app that yeah. i really wanted to get on but i never got the like the the code to join i think they're trying to do something yeah, like they, clubhouse and i'm like yo it's still what was what was it called p it's or something spill. oh spill that's what I'm like you're like i'm still not on there because i never got the code so i'm like Yo, you guys lost kind of because of the user experience. Because I definitely am a fan of like you know black engineers or, or black companies trying to build something. But again, you guys lost the the user experience battle. Like I literally click one button, um, I'm on Threads. That's a big deal to me. So like, and again, and in my realm, since I've been so much on the front end, the full stop user experience is a big deal. So that's part of my role as well. No, definitely agree. Uh, so everything is art. Also says you worked at Spitter too. Oh wow. Okay. So you worked at Spitter. You worked at Meta. So I'm gonna definitely reach out to you for the next interview. I'd love to pick your brain about your experience at both, or just uh, your experience of world in tech. But yeah, no, I, I definitely th thread was interesting. I definitely share the same set of sentiments with the integration. The UX was just like off the charts, and I think that's why a lot of people love it. But just like, like you mentioned, where people are not gonna love it in the future is where the censorship comes into place. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be inevitable with the censorship because it is a public company versus Twitter being private, that there will be a point in time where it's, hey, Facebook, oh, Facebook, <laughs> thread. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs> where, where thread is going to be like, hey, you can't say that. Oh, this doesn't align with our values. And then it's going to be a, a point in time where people, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm going to just go back to Twitter. Yeah. And there should be a guideline. There should be some um, facts checks going on in place. But until Thread introduces that, I think it's not going to be able to compete eye to eye with, with Twitter as of now because they they've been pretty decent at that. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we at an hour and fifteen minutes. I don't want to keep you for too long. Uh, before we hop on, was there any like final thoughts or gems you want to drop for the people? Um, yeah, I guess my gems, like, you know, I, I feel like go after it, right? <laughs> I, I'm like, my, I, my old boss will, will kill me because I'm, this is her, her term, but I, uh, Renee Baker, I'll shout her out because that, that's just where I, I, um, I get it from. But it really is because, you know, talking to you, I thought about where I was at that time in college with my first, with my, um, experience with computer science. You could, you couldn't tell me I'd be in technology, right? With, with having that bad teacher. But I really didn't let that affect me. I like I hustled. I kind of like okay, I just did, and I end up just kind of fiddling and tink tink tinker around in it. So I'm like, don't let a bad experience kind of stop you from what direction you want to take. And know that also there's more than one way to kind of skin a skin a cat, right? So you know, also keep you know keep your options open. Have a bunch of good people around you, but don't let a bad experience stop you from doing something new or trying this new direction. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Don't allow folks to stop your growth. Yeah, that goes for everything. But no, once again, Flo, appreciate it. I'm gonna reach out to you. We gotta do lunch sometime. There's a new restaurant that I'm gonna hit you up about. We gotta check it out. You do sushi? Yeah, sure. yeah no, I eat. Man, I eat every. Well, no, wait, I'm pescatarian. Oh. But yeah, I do, I do, <laughs> I'm about to say I eat everything. But I eat everything within reason. And that realm, I used to be a true fruity before. I, I mean, I ate all the stuff. But if the only meat I eat is seafood, but I eat everything else. I bet. Um, I bet. So, yeah. It works out just fine. So I'll reach out to you. We got to connect since we both out here in Tampa. So appreciate this once again. All right. Facts. All right. Thank y'all. Uh, peace and love. All right, peace. All right.